invite you to stand with me as we offer our opening prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for who you are. We entrust ourselves entirely to you. So Lord, as we praise you this morning, may we hear a word from you today. Show us how we ought to live and send your Holy Spirit to transform our hearts and minds and prepare us for that day when we will see you face to face. We ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, hymn number 457, I Love to Tell the Story.
Amen. Thank you for that. Well, good morning again. We're glad that uh, you're here to worship with us this morning. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas. Uh, I know for myself, it was good to be back home in Oregon with family, uh, my parents, my sisters, and their families. And I even got to see a little bit of snow, just a little bit. Um, but you imagine my shock coming back yesterday to 80 degree weather. Um, so hopefully you had a, a nice Christmas, even if it wasn't a a white Christmas. But as we look forward to uh, the new year, I just wanted to remind everyone of a couple of really important programs that we have here at the church, and uh, maybe this is a good opportunity for you to get started. First is Wednesday nights. We have our Koinonia program that begins at 7 o'clock in the chapel. We begin there with some singing, and then we break off into smaller groups where we can uh, study together, uh, discuss together, pray together. Uh, it's really a, a great time. So if you haven't been before or if you haven't been in a while, this Wednesday, January 3rd, is a good jumping on point. We're going to begin a, a new series of topics. We'll be talking about uh, discipleship, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And in some ways, I think we'll be really kind of setting the stage for the vision and the direction for Vallejo Drive in the year to come. Uh, so it's definitely something that I think everyone will want to be a part of. And I can say in all honesty that being a part of uh, the Wednesday night Koinonia program has regularly been uh, the highlight of my week uh, in the past year. Just to be able to be with people who are passionate about uh, God's Word, uh, people who are curious and hungry, uh, but also people who are, you know, uh, honest and vulnerable. Uh, there's been great moments of sharing, great moments of shared insight, the kind of blessing that you can really only get from that uh, sort of group interaction. So uh, if you would like to be a part of something like this, but maybe one of your concerns is uh, children that you have to take care of, uh, we do have an excellent, excellent children's program that runs alongside it that we call Koinonia Kids. And so that also begins at 7 o'clock. And just to be clear, this is more than just babysitting. Uh, this is really an extension of our children's ministry that we have here on Sabbath mornings. Uh, and this is something that uh, leads out every Wednesday night. Um, so I know that even if you were to come just for the kids, it would definitely be worth it. And as always, I want to remind everyone uh, that Friday nights, everyone is welcome to our Praxis worship service on Friday nights in the chapel at 7.30. And this Friday night, uh, we will actually be uh, experimenting with something a little bit different. So I encourage all of you to come and check it out if you haven't been before. So I hope that we can all start out the new year on the right foot spiritually and maybe being a part of one of these programs, uh, committing uh, to being here and to being a part of uh, a community of fellowship uh, will be the way to, to do that. So I know God will bless you as you seek to draw closer to him this year. Now is the time for our children's story. I see Pastor Peter is ready. Uh, so if the children want to come forward at this time and the rest of us, uh, feel free to stretch your legs and uh, turn to someone next to you and greet your neighbor this morning. God bless.
Well, good morning, boys and girls. Oh, I'm not sure you heard me. Let's try that again. Good morning, boys and girls. Oh, now you sound like you're here. What a wonderful week it's been for all of us. Have you had a good week? Did you have a good Christmas? Wonderful. Well, today I've got a story for you. All right. All right. And my little boy, Jesse, is going to help me tell the story today. Right? <laughs> this is a story about... This is a story about a robber. It was midnight when this robber, this thief, entered into the room, into the house. He broke into this house at midnight. And he went from room to room in this house trying to get all the valuables he could find, looking for all the things he could steal in this house at midnight. And the house was very, very dark. He could hardly see anything, but he felt sure he was all alone. And all of a sudden, he heard in the middle of the darkness this high-pitched, piercing voice that said, Jesus is watching you. Jesus is watching you. Jesus is watching you. And it startled him. And he looked up to where the voice was coming from. And there, perched on a ledge near the rooftop, he saw a little bitty parrot bird that said simply, Jesus is watching you. Jesus is watching you. And in a fit of rage and anger, he said, what's wrong with you, you crazy bird? Don't you have anything better to do than to sit there and say, Jesus is watching you. Jesus is watching you. And in that very moment, as his eyes grew more accustomed to the darkness, he saw crouched in front of him, just like four feet in front of him, he saw the big, mean-looking sh German shepherd dog, the biggest German shepherd dog he had ever seen in his life, standing right in front of him. And in that very moment, the bird said, Sick him, Jesus! You know, boys and girls, I am so glad that Jesus, our friend, is not like that dog. Jesus is not like this German shepherd dog ready to pounce on you when you do wrong. Oh, no, he isn't. In fact, our Jesus is a savior. He comes to save you when you do wrong. Isn't that wonderful? And today, as Pastor Shane preaches from Luke chapter 2, in that story, we hear about Jesus as he was born as a baby, came into the world. It's a wonderful story. In that story, Simeon, a devout Christian Jewish man said, my eyes have seen God's salvation. And I want you to know that no matter what you do, Jesus loves you and he came to save you. Amen? And you can live life knowing that if you trust him and if you follow him, you will be saved. Jesus is not out to get you. He's out to save you. Let's just pray real quick. Dear Jesus, we thank you for these dear children here today. We thank you for your great salvation. Lead us now to love you and trust you as your children. Amen. I want to dismiss you now. For those of you who are age 4 to 12,
We have Children's Church, and you're free to go to Children's Church right now. Thank you so much. God bless you. I'd like to invite the deacons to come up for this time of offering. Today's offering is focused on Pacific Union College and while the loose offering is for the church budget. This last summer I took a couple um, classes at my community college and in those classes I had some discussions on ethics and I felt like after every point I had to make I had to think of this preface to say I had to think of something like well um, I grew up in a religious home and I think this, or being a Christian, I believe this. Um, I got so used to that, that when I took my first religion class at an SDA college, I realized that I didn't have to say things like that. And um, I also realized that there was this overarching commonality between many of the, the people on that campus. Adventist education gives the students an opportunity to grow physically, mentally, and spiritually in an environment with people that just want to be like Jesus. Um, as the deacons do collect the offering, I want you guys to think about Christian education and what it's doing for the lives of young people and what it will continue to do with our support. Um, the deacons may collect the offering now.
Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be here together um, this Sabbath morning just to praise you and be with you. I ask that you bless this offering and that it may just be used according to your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this morning I awoke and thinking this was the Sabbath day. Your day, Heavenly Father. You created it for us so that we could enjoy a day, a special day, and you even made it holy. Thank you, Lord. You are the Word, Lord. And as I was reading my Bible, I read that if anyone's against you, who can be a, if, if, Lord, sorry. If you're on our side, who can be against us? I got to thinking about that. How wonderful a thought that is. You're on our side, Lord. You came, you died, you rose, that we can have you on our side. We ask that you would give us the faith to never forget that. Thank you, Lord, for that promise. Regardless of where we are, we don't know whether we're going to be able to pay the electric bills this month, or we've got some terrible disease or some calamity, or on and on and on, Lord. Help us to never forget that you're on our side. Be with Sean this morning, Lord, as he brings us the word, the precious word that you have given us that we might have faith we might never forget. Because when we forget, Lord, we're out there on our own. We need you on our side and we're there regardless. So thank you, Lord, and bless us. Keep us for Jesus' sake, amen. Our scripture reading today is found in Luke 2, 22 to 35. I will be reading from the New International Version. You may follow the reading on the screens. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice 
in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and it should be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and the sword will pierce your own soul too. Amen. Thank you for that. Thank you for the wonderful music, our, our guest musicians while uh, our choir is on break. But this has been a wonderful Sabbath so far. And I am glad that, uh, as I said before, our Christmas decorations are still up. Um, as you may know, the old uh, tradition of the 12 days of Christmas, today would be the sixth day of Christmas. So w Christmas is only half over, those of you who are worried that we're dragging this on too long. Uh, you know, I was told recently Christmas, I think, stands for such a profound truth of God taking on human flesh that it can't be contained in just one day, but it gets its own season. We're called again and again to meditate our minds on this great mystery. And so today's gospel reading picks up shortly after the birth story this Christmas narrative. Uh, having been born in Bethlehem and having been circumcised on the eighth day, uh, in keeping with the law of Moses, the Gospel of Luke tells us that when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law, every firstborn male should be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. So according to the command laid out in Leviticus, this sacrificial offering would take place 40 days after the child's birth. Mary, as a woman who gives birth to a son, must go on the 40th day to receive a ceremonial cleansing. That's what the sacrifices are for. And likewise, Jesus, as the firstborn son, must be dedicated to the Lord. So Joseph and Mary are compelled by the law of Moses to bring an animal sacrifice to the temple priest. Now the law says, in fact, that they are required to bring a young lamb less than a year old. But Moses says that if she cannot afford a sheep, she shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. So when Luke tells us that Mary comes offering these two birds, he's reminding us of the poverty of Mary and Joseph, that they can't afford the normal sacrifice that the law would require. And the fact that Mary and Joseph can't afford the traditional sacrifice reminds us of a most crucial and central component of this whole sacrificial system. And I think we have a tendency to forget it, or at least overlook it. And that is that sacrifice is costly. 
Now, you might think, well, that's the most obvious thing that anyone knows about sacrifice, is that it's costly. This is the way we use the expression all the time. If we talk about, uh, you know, a mother that has sacrificed so much for her children, what do we mean? But the things that she has given up, the things that she has lost, what has come at a cost to her for the benefit of her children. Time can be sacrificed. Money can be sacrificed. A career or ambition can be sacrificed. And all of this comes at the cost of the one who is sacrificing. So why do I say that we have a tendency to overlook the costliness of sacrifice? Well, it seems to me that when we think about the sacrifice of Jesus, we throw out of our minds everything that we know about sacrifice. There's a tendency to think that Christ's sacrifice comes at his cost and not at our cost. That the sacrifice of Christ means loss to Jesus, but it means strictly gain to us. But in framing it this way, we have missed the first and most obvious point of the lesson of animal sacrifice, which is that it comes at a price, not just to the victim, obviously, but to the one offering the sacrifice. You see, the one who brings sacrifice and the sacrificial victim become one in the act of sacrifice. Now that is very much my central point this morning, so I, I'm just going to say that one more time so that you can get it. The one offering the sacrifice and the sacrificial victim become one with each other in the act of sacrifice. Just ask the young couple of Mary and Joseph if sacrifice comes at a price to them. And obviously it does because they couldn't even afford uh, the typical sacrifice that God would have demanded. But Mary comes to the temple not just with her animal sacrifice of two young pigeons, she also comes to offer her first and only son. You see, God made a claim on the firstborn son of all the families in Israel. He claimed them as his own. And so they were brought to the temple and dedicated to the Lord. They were offered up. This tradition clearly echoes uh, the story of Abraham, who was commanded by God to take his son Isaac and sacrifice him. Now, of course, God in the end does not want Abraham to take his son's life, but he does want Abraham to demonstrate his total willingness to surrender his son to God and to God's will. He is, in a real sense, sacrificing his son. This is why God says to him in Genesis 22, because you have done this and have not withheld your only son from me, I will indeed bless you. And in much the same way, when a woman would bring her firstborn son to the temple, the most economically valuable of her children, she would dedicate him to the Lord, offer him up in a sense, acknowledging that this son no longer belongs to her, but belongs to God. Now, unfortunately, this understanding of sacrifice, of, of giving over, both of the gift and ultimately of ourselves, right? Because when a person dedicates their child, it's not just the child that's being dedicated, but you as a parent now see your child differently. It's given back to you as a gift, not something that you own, but something that you're a steward of. So this idea of our participation in the sacrificial act is something that we've missed because we've become so fixated on this idea of substitution, the idea of God demanding blood as a substitution, as if God were saying, I ought to kill you, but instead I will kill this innocent animal. I think that's what certainly I grew up being told, and I think that's what many of us have been told. But not only is this problematic because it depicts God as literally bloodthirsty, but it also has the unfortunate consequence of, of making us think that Christ's suffering, the one whom all these animal sacrifices point forward to, 
makes us think that Christ's suffering is somehow instead of our own suffering. When we don't realize that far from Christ's suffering instead of us, we are called to suffer with Christ. When the Bible says that he is the Lamb of God, he is our sacrificial offering. We are the ones who offer it to God, and we then are called to participate in that sacrifice, not be substituted by it. And perhaps we have come to think of the sacrifice of Christ as something so distant from us, something so removed in time and space, so sanitized, because we ourselves have been so removed and distant, have become distant from the practice of animal sacrifice. But any person in the ancient world would have known that the one offering a sacrifice and the sacrifice being offered are one with each other. Nothing could be more obvious to a rural shepherd in ancient Israel that to sacrifice a lamb, a spotless and healthy lamb, comes not only at a cost to the lamb, but at a cost to the shepherd. Now our gospel continues now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. His name, Simeon, comes from the Hebrew word Shema, meaning to hear. That most famous of Hebrew prayers, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. Simeon is the one who hears. Simeon is the one who is attuned to God, who, as the Bible says, is guided by the Spirit. Luke goes on to say, It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. So guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. You see, Simeon, incidentally, is a great example of this spirit of sacrifice that we're discussing this morning. For when he sees the Christ child, what does he say? But Lord, now let your servant go in peace. You see, God does not demand Simeon's life, but he offers it up freely. And why? Because he recognizes that to see God, as he is doing now, to come face to face with his creator, is the greatest fulfillment of the human soul. There is no greater happiness than to encounter God face to face. And so having secured the one thing, the one thing that could ever matter, that is to see God, he relinquishes control of his own life. So overwhelmed by the presence and the satisfaction of being in God's presence, he surrenders his life up to God. He says, Lord, now let your servant go in peace. And as he holds the infant Jesus in his arms to dedicate him to the Lord, to offer him up like Isaac, he joins himself to that offering. He gives himself over to God. For my eyes have seen your salvation, he says. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother, Mary, this child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel. Now this prophecy seems as if it's saying that Christ is destined to cause ruin and success for many. This child is destined for the falling and rising of many. And certainly there is a sense in which that is true. Just one chapter earlier, Mary had said uh, in her song, 
You have cast down the mighty from their thrones and have lifted up the lowly. So there are some that God brings down and some that God lifts up. But I think Simeon's prophecy here has, in fact, a deeper meaning because he says literally that the child is destined for the falling and the getting back up of many in Israel. He uses in Greek the same term that is translated throughout the rest of the New Testament as resurrection. So we could say, in other words, that Simeon's prophecy is that this child is destined for the death and resurrection of many. You see, Simeon is the one who hears. Simeon is the one who is in tune with God. He understands the clear message of Scripture that we have such a hard time accepting, which is that there is no resurrection without death. We want the joy of coming back to life without the pain of losing life. But the Bible will tell us clearly that sharing in the life of Christ means also sharing in the death of Christ. Paul tells the Philippians, he says, For his sake, for Christ's sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. You see, not only does Paul believe that Christ has suffered for his sake, he believes that we too are called to suffer for Christ's sake. He continues, I regard all things as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Of his resurrection. And I hope we can agree with that. We want to know Christ. We want to experience his resurrection by sharing in his sufferings. By becoming like him in his death, Paul says, so that I may somehow attain to the resurrection from the dead. The Bible is clear. We have a share in Christ's resurrection as a consequence of being joined to his sacrifice. So I believe that Simeon foresaw in the death and resurrection of Jesus the death and resurrection of all those who would be joined to him. All those who would be one with him. He saw the falling and rising of many in Israel. Simeon will then go on to say, and he, that is Jesus, will be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. In other words, when the nation has Christ put to death, their own true selves will be revealed. And while speaking of the death of Christ, he says to Mary, and a sword will pierce your soul too. A sword will pierce your soul too. Just last night, I was speaking with someone who uh, has a, a son who's off at school, and he'll be returning later this week, and just talking about uh, the pain of that kind of separation. I know those of you with, with children who are, who are off somewhere else, you know what that's like. I know even for myself, my own family, saying goodbye is always hard. Now imagine a mother looking up at her dying son. By no means could we ever say that the son suffers instead of his mother. No. A sword will pierce your soul too. I can't help but think of the famous sculpture by Michelangelo, the, Piet the Pietà, which depicts the body of Jesus having been taken down from the cross and laying in Mary's lap. Imagine the scene and tell me what exactly it is that Mary has been spared from. Far from it. Instead, we see a fulfillment of this prophecy of Simeon. A sword will pierce your own soul too. And Mary, in this case, is a model for all Christians. At the cross, it is not only the body of the Lord that is pierced, but his mother's heart. 
And in this way, she becomes an example for us who are called to be crucified with Christ. With this image of her pierced soul, we are reminded of the command of Christ. If anyone would be my disciple, let them take up their cross and follow me. Mary, perhaps more than anyone, knows what it means to truly be crucified with Christ. She shows us how we ought to relate to the cross because she is one who shares in the pain of the cross, who participates in that sacrifice. And so, in closing, if we ever wonder what that looks like, what this means practically to share in the sufferings of Christ, what does it mean to have our soul pierced like Mary? What does it mean to take up our cross and be crucified with Christ? It means quite simply, I think, to live a life of detachment, to acknowledge that your life is not your own, but you belong wholly and completely to God. The Apostle Paul himself summarizes it best when he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let this same mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so I urge you as we stand at the beginning of a new year to dedicate yourselves to the Lord, to be like Abraham, to be like Simeon, to be like Mary, who through their faith and their obedience joined themselves to the sacrifice of Christ. And as we take time each day to stand before the cross and contemplate the sacrifice of Christ, may we, as the Bible says, die daily. Let us participate in the sacrifice of Christ by offering our own bodies as a living sacrifice. If that's your desire this morning, I'd invite you to stand with me as we sing our final hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be.
the Apostle Paul, brothers and sisters, put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If one has a grievance against another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so must you also do. And over all these put on love, that is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of Christ control your hearts, the peace into which you were also called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as in all wisdom you teach and admonish one another, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen.